14th, about 4 o'clock, a great number of visitors came to Longwood. They were passengers who had arrived by the East India fleet, and the emperor had signified his willingness to receive them. The party consisted of Mr. Strange, the brother-in-law, brother-in-law of Lord Melville, First Lord of the English Admiralty, a Mr. Arbuthnot, and Sir William Burroughs, one of the judges of the Supreme Court of Calcutta, two of Lord Moira's aides de camp, some others together with several ladies. We were all conversing together in the antechamber when the emperor left his own room to proceed to the garden. This circumstance excited the curiosity of our visitors who eagerly flew to the windows to see him pass by. The scene reminded us of Plymouth. The Grand Marshal conducted our visitors to the presence of the emperor. He received them with the most perfect grace and with that captivating smile which has exercised such irresistible power curiosity and lively emotion where it paints it in the countenances of all the emperor conversed with each individual and according to custom instantly seized any circumstance that happened to be connected with their names as he heard them announced he discoursed with the supreme judge on the legislation of the administration of justice with the company's officers on trade and the internal government of India. He questioned the military gentlemen as to how many years they had served and how many wounds they had received. He paid many flattering compliments to the ladies and remarked that the climate of Bengal had not spoiled the delicacy of their complexions. Then addressing himself to one of Lord Moira's aides de camp, he observed that the Grand Marshal had informed him that Lady Loudon was on the island and that had she been within his limits, he should have had great pleasure in paying his compliments to her. But did as she happen to reside beyond the boundaries that had been prescribed to him, he had no opportunity of seeing her than if she were still at Bengal. During these conversations in which I acted as interpreter, Mr. Strange, with whom I had previously been talking, drew me aside to, by the flap of my coat and in a tone of surprise and satisfaction said, what grace and dignity of manners the emperor displays. He shows he has been accustomed to the etiquette of holding a levee. We conducted the company to the drawing room and curiosity led them to take a peep at the emperor's apartments. Sir William Burroughs, who from the post he holds may be supposed to have some connection with the English ministry, on entering the drawing room asked me whether it was our dining room. I informed him that it was the drawing room, or that we might more properly say it was the only room in the house. At this he was much astonished. I then pointed out to him through the window the two little chambers which are all the emperor has for his own use. His countenance expressed regret. And he seemed in his own mind to be drawing comparisons between the present and the past, remarking the wretchedness of the furniture and the narrow limits of our abode. He said with an air of concern, you will be provided better soon. How, said I, is there any attention to removing us from the island? No, but some elegant furniture and a commodious house are to be sent to you. We do not, I replied, complain of the furniture or the house, but of the rock to which we have been banished. And the latitude in which it is situated, the latitude cannot be changed. And we can never be well here. I repeated to him literally what the emperor had a few days previously said to the governor on the same subject. Sir William was amazed and pressed my hand. He said with a degree of worth, my dear sir, he is too great and too gifted a man. We have too much cause to dread and fear him. But said I in my turn, why not have driven? the car of glory together, instead of mutually destroying each other by dragging different ways. What might not then have been its course? He looked at me and again pressing my hand, he said to the pensive air, yes, that would doubtless have been better, but all were particularly struck with the emperor's freedom of manners and his tranquil expression of countenance. I know not what they had expected to see. One remarked that he could scarcely form a conception of the strength and mind necessary to enable Napoleon to endure such wonderful reverses. That is, replied I, because nobody yet well knows the emperor's character. He told us the other day that he had been like a block of marble during all the great events of his life, that they had slipped over him without producing any impression either in his moral or physical faculties. After dinner, the emperor asked us, as he often does, 
what we should like to read. Some have proposed that we should resume the Dictionary of Weathercocks, but this the Emperor objected to on the ground that it served, but to render his evenings more unpleasant. Rather, let us amuse ourselves with fiction, said he, and asking for Jerusalem delivered. He read aloud several cantos of that poem, occasionally translating passages into French. He then read the chief part, both of Phaedra and Attali, always expressing his great admiration of the writings of Racine. The 15th, the emperor during his walk conversed on various subjects, and at length happened a light on that of crimes and punishments. He observed that the greatest jurists, even those who had been influenced by the spirit of the age, were divided as to the principle of the equalization of capital punishments, at the establishment of the code, he should have been averse to equalization, but not circumstances obliged him to adopt a contrary course. He asked my opinion. I am, said I, decidedly favorable to the inequality of punishments. Our notions demand a gradation in punishments analogous to that which we conceive in crimes. The harmony of our sensations seems to require this. I can never bring myself to rank on a level with each other. The wretch who has murdered his father and him who has merely committed a slight robbery accompanied by violence. Should these two criminals be visited by the same punishment? In this question, the criminal himself is least of all to be considered. The punishment is his business. And humanity discovers many hidden modes of relieving his physical suffering. His ideas previously to the commission of the crime the feelings which his punishment creates in the minds of the spectators and the effect it produces on society in general. These are the points which must claim the attention of the legislator in deciding the question of the equalization of punishments. It is erroneous to suppose that death alone is sufficient and that the kind of death has no influence on the mind of the criminal in the premeditation of his crime. For if there be inequality of punishment, there is no culprit who would not make his choice. If he were permitted to do so, let let any member of society consult his own feelings. He would shudder at the very idea of certain punishments, while perhaps he would be totally indifferent to certain modes of death. The inequality of punishments and the solemnity of executions belong, therefore, to the justice and policy of civilization. Yet I conceive that it would now be impossible to subdue public opinion on this subject. The emperor entirely concurred in these ideas, having mentioned the crime of regicide. He observed that it might truly be said to be the greatest of all crimes, owing to the consequences which it produced. The man, said he, who might have raised his arm to murder me in France, would have subverted all Europe. And how many times have I not been exposed to assassination? Lady Loudon, wife of Lord Moira, the Governor General of India, has been for several days at St. Helena, where she attracts general attention. She is a lady of high rank, corresponding nearly with a French duchess under the old regime. The English officers treat her with the utmost respect. Today, the admiral invited her to a little fit on board the Northumberland. He sent a messenger on horseback to request me to lend him my atlas for the evening in order that he might show it to Lady Loudon, whose husband was described in it as the first representative of the Plantagenets and consequently as the legitimate heir to the throne of England. The admiral and I were on a footing of perfect indifference. Indeed, we had had been nearly strangers to each other since the moment he put me ashore. The request was not so much a mark of politeness to me as a compliment to the work itself. The Atlas had been the subject of conversation. The lady had expressed a wish to see it, and the Admiral felt a desire to show it to her. However, I was unable to satisfy this desire. The book was in the Emperor's chamber, and such was the answer I returned. The Emperor smiled at the honor which the Admiral had intended for me, and I could not help pity the amusement that had been prepared for the lady. This circumstance led the emperor himself to speak of the atlas and to repeat some observations which had fallen from him before. He remarked that he heard my work spoken of at all times and all places, that he found it sought after by foreigners as well as Frenchmen. He had heard it mentioned on board the Barafin on the Northumberland at the island of St. Helena and in short everywhere. Persons of information and rank either knew the work or expressed a wish to become acquainted with it. This, said he in a lively strain, is what I call enjoying a real triumph, a great reputation in the literary world. I wish you would give me the history of this atlas. Tell me when and how you conceived the idea of it, the manner in which it was executed, and its results, why you first of all published it under a fictitious name. 
and why you did not afterwards affix your real name to it. In short, give me a true and particular account. You understand, Mr. Counselor of State? I replied that it would be a long story, though to me the recital would not be devoid of pleasure, for I added that my atlas was the history of a great portion of my life, and that above all I was indebted to it for the happiness of being now near the person of the emperor. The following is a narrative such as it appeared when corrected after my first hasty notes. Its length doubtless requires indulgence, but this I trust the reader will be inclined to grant on consideration that the details which I I hear enter and to revive the recollection of my happiest years, of the period of my youth, my health and strength, in a word, of the dear but brief interval of the plenitude of life. I once more entreat that the reader will pardon the prolixity in which I have indulged, but this statement so forcibly resides, revives my recollections of past happiness that even now in reading it over I cannot find it in my heart to cancel any part of it. History of my atlas. This work was partly the fruit of chance, but above all of necessity, which, as the common proverb says, is the mother of industry at the time of the first reverses of the French emigrants. I was cast by the political hurricane in the streets of London, without friends, without money, without resources, but possessing the requisite courage and willingness for exertion to a man animated by such a spirit. London at that time afforded certain sources of emotion. After having unsuccessfully made several applications, I determined to rely on myself alone, and like Figaro, I decided on turning author. For a moment, I had thoughts of becoming a romance writer. This idea was suggested to me by the proposals of a bookseller, but he required too much, and was inclined to pay too little. I then turned my thoughts to writing history, which at all events was calculated to procure for me a certain moral advantage by storing my mind with positive knowledge it was then i conceived the first idea of my atlas which i may truly regard as an inspiration from heaven for to it i owed my life the work was at first a simple sketch a mere nomenclature very different from the form in which it now appears however sufficed immediately to relieve me from the embarrassment and to secure to me what might be called a little fortune in comparison with the miseries endured by the other emigrants. Then, sire, came the peace of Amiens, and the benefits conferred on us by your amnesty. I was enabled to make a journey to France, merely as a traveler, having no other object in view than to breathe my native air and to see the French capital. There I found myself at liberty to express my sentiments without restraint. Investigation was easy. My ideas and my judgment were enlarged. I was master of my time, and I undertook to arrange my atlas in the form in which it now appears. I proposed publishing regularly four sheets per quarter. I was now vastly improved both in my mind and circumstances. Interest, attention, good offers, money, and connections poured in upon me, and I may confidently affirm that this was the happiest period of my life. In England, I had published my work under a feigned name in order to avoid compromising the honor of my own. I happen to fix upon Le Sage, just as I might have decided on Le Blanc, Le Gris, or Le Noir. But I could not have made a more unlucky choice, or at least I could not have assumed a more general appellation. Sometime after a letter which was intended for me passed through all the different colonies of French emigrants in London and was delivered by tourists and 22 priests who all bore the name Lesage. At length, one who had apparently discovered that the name did not belong to me sent me the letter in a violent rage, observing that when people thought proper to change their names, they should at least avoid taking those that belonged to other individuals. In France, I still preserved the name of Lesage, which had now become identified with my atlas. To have published it under a new name might have led to the supposition that it was a new work. Besides, I did not wish to expose my own name to the chance of ill success, to the attacks of the journals, or the bickerings of criticism. Even though I had been assured of the complete success of the work, I should not probably have felt the more inclined to fix my real name to it, owing to a remnant of my old prejudices, of which I could not 
easily divest myself. Certainly this literary fame flattered me, not a little, but I had sprung from a warlike race, and I conceived that I was in duty bound to pursue fame of another kind. However, circumstances rendered this impossible, and I think it proper to mention that at least I was not unconscious of the duty. I never had cause to repent of my double appellation, independently of my real motive for assuming it. It diffused around me an air of adventure and romance which was by no means disagreeable, and which was moreover in unison with my tempered character. It occasioned many mistakes in humorous scenes, which afforded me considerable amusement. In England, for example, I have often, when in company, been questioned in the most innocent way imaginable respecting the merits of Monsieur Lesage's work. At a boarding school, I was once addressed in a very this courteous language because I absolutely persisted in condemning my own atlas. So long as I continued myself to manage the publication of the work, my method was to treat in person with every individual who offered to set their names down as subscribers. I had no favors to solicit. I rather found it necessary in some instances to guard against receiving those that were offered in France. Particularly, I was overwhelmed with acts of kindness and flattering compliments. Some paid me these attentions because they knew me, and others precisely because they did not know me. But I was in every instance greatly indebted for them to my determination of preserving perfect equilibrium with all parties. For my part, I enjoy the curious spectacle that now presented itself to me as everyone who wished to become a subscriber was obliged to give in his own name. I took a review of many characters whom I well knew and observed them in silence. I was thus enabled to meditate at my ease on the curious diversity of opinion, judgment, and taste. The point which one condemned was precisely that which another most admired, which a third declared to be indispensable, and which a fourth pronounced to be inadmissible. Each, according to custom, failed not to set forth his own opinion as the prevailing one. It was the sentiment of all Paris and of everybody. I had now an opportunity of being convinced of the great advantage a man derives from superintending his own business himself, and of the important influence of politeness and good manners in all the affairs of life. I acceded to everything that was proposed. I received every hint that was suggested, and I was repaid a hundredfold for my complacence. It frequently happened that a person who had called on me without any intention of purchasing the work was not only induced to carry it away with him, but brought me 10, 20, or even 100 additional subscribers. One described my atlas at a classic work. Two, the Minister of the Interior, and other recommended it to the Minister for Foreign Affairs. A third promised to procure for me the decorations of the Legion of Honor. And a fourth wrote a flattering critique on the work. I got it inserted in the public journals. Some carried their interest and attachment for me even to a degree of enthusiasm of this the following are instances. One of my provincial subscribers who was unacquainted with me wrote to request as a particular favor that I would get my portrait engraved to embellish the work offering in case I acceded to the proposition to defray half of the expenses of the engraving. Another who was the owner of the Chateau de Montmorency paid me a visit every week under pretense of inquiring whether I had got a new sheet of my atlas ready for publication, but in reality, as he himself assured me to pass his happiness hours in my society. He added that if ever I should take a fancy to sell my conversation as I did the sheets of my work, it was in my power if I chose to ruin him. I afterwards learned that this is a man of a very eccentric turn, one of La Bruyere's characters, quite after the manner of Jean-Jacques for a considerable time. He seemed to rack his inventions in making me offers of service in the most delicate way imaginable. He even went so far as to throw out paternal suggestions to me. Mr. Lesage, said he, oftener than once, you want to marry. You possess qualities that are calculated to ensure the happiness of a wife, and still more that of a father-in-law. I must not omit to mention that the old gentleman had but one daughter, and she was a rich heiress. However, the warmth of our intimacy gradually abated till at length I entirely lost the acquaintance. 
It was not until a considerable time after, when being on a country excursion with a party of ladies, the sight of the Chateau de Montmorency revived the recollection of my old friend. I related the history of his eccentricities to the ladies who accompanied me. The curiosity was excited, and we determined to visit the castle. The porter refused to admit us. On my inquiring whether the gentleman was at his country residence, I received for an answer that he was there, and that this was precisely the reason why we could not be admitted. I thought it very extraordinary that he should thus immure himself in his castle and render himself totally inaccessible. With considerable difficulty, I prevailed on the servant to announce Monsieur Lesage. The sound of the name operated like enchantment. The affront offered to an elegant calash and rich liveries was immediately repaired. The gates were thrown open, apparently. To the no small astonishment of the porter, the servants received orders to show us over the castle and to offer us every kind of refreshment. We had brought with us in the carriage provisions for a little rural repast, but a sumptuous dinner was laid out for us in one of the best apartments of the castle, and we could not with anything like good grace decline accepting what was so politely offered to us. All this hospitality was perfectly disinterested on the part of the worthy old gentleman who was confined to his chamber with the gout. He was overjoyed at seeing me, and he seemed to regard my visit as the return of the prodigal son. He insisted on seeing the ladies who accompanied me, and he was carried into the dining room to do the honors of the dessert. One thing that amused us infinitely was that he seemed to have no idea of the rank of the friends by whom I was accompanied, and he treated them like persons of inferior rank, though they were in reality ladies of distinction. The old gentleman would now scarcely allow me to depart. He insisted on my repeating my visit and said that I and all my friends should ever be received with welcome in his castle. But alas, I could not avail myself of his kindness. For a few days after, I read in the papers the death of this good and sincere friend from the commencement of my greatness. I may, under every point of view, date the termination of the golden age of my atlas when I was transplanted to court and permitted to approach your majesty's person. I conceived that I could not, with propriety, descend to the details that had hitherto occupied me. I confined the management of the copyright to one of my old college companions who had been an emigrant like myself, but who did not turn the publication to so good an account as I had done on entering upon my new post at court. I was loaded with compliments on my production, but to these I replied indifferently, and just as one would do at a ball after dropping one's mask. When it was found that I never alluded to my work, that I never quoted from it, and that I avoided all dissertations on it. I was never spoken to on this subject, and at length people began to wonder how I'd ever written it, and indeed to doubt whether I had any right at all to be considered its author. On hearing these words, the Empress said to me, my dearest causes, this doubt has found its way even to St. Helena. I have heard it affirmed that the work was not written by you, that you purchased the manuscript from the real author, and in support of this assertion. It has been remarked that you know nothing at all about the book because you never speak of it. To these observations, continued he, I have merely contented myself with saying, did you never know any question to remain without a complete answer? Besides, I recognize throughout the whole work the style, the very expression of Les Cases. Many, said I, resuming my narrative, will think I injured myself by this denial, but I preferred good taste to quackery, and I was only acting according to the dictates of my natural disposition. Your Majesty was the other day, describing how Cetus used to present himself loaded with written plans, and at the very first word of contradiction, as soon as he found it necessary to act on the defense, he would gather up his papers and be off in a moment. This was precisely my feeling. I never could stand up publicly to support my opinions. Before I could do this, I must enjoy the authority of rank or the freedom of intimate friendship. Otherwise, I prefer dooming myself to silence. That is to say, when I am not interrogated and urged to the point. But to return to my subject, so long as I remain in obscurity, I 
ensured the goodwill of everyone, but my elevation rendered me an object of enmity, and I felt the influence of that vague sentiment of envy and benevolence, which ever follows the footsteps of fortune. The public journals, which for a length of time had overflowed with flattery and agreeable expressions in favor of the historical atlas, now inserted some very ill-natured articles respecting the work, and when these were traced to their source, the writers frankly avowed that they had been occasioned solely by changes that had taken place in political opinions and public affairs. A report was delivered to the Institute of all the works that had appeared for several years past, and in this report, the Atlas was very severely treated, happening to be one day in the company with the author of this report, to whom I was known only by the name of Lesage. I expressed to him my dissatisfaction at what he had said of the Atlas. He candidly confessed that the work and its author were alike unknown to him, that having found the labor of writing the report too much for him, he had divided the task among several other individuals. He informed me that the article on Lesage's Atlas had been infinitely more severe when delivered to him then it appeared on its insertion in the report. He had softened it down considerably. I can easily perceive, continued he, that you have enemies in the literary world, and for these you are indebted to your habits and your situation. You have connected yourself with a count somebody who holds place at court, but courtiers and authors never agree well together. Those gentlemen are, for the most part, very unlike us. It is said that in this curious partnership, you supply the talent, and he provides the money. What's the use of that? The count is only making his profits on you. Your work is good, and your bookseller would have remunerated you for it. However, I'm only repeating what I've heard, and I advise you to what I conceive to be your interest. If you wish to enjoy our suffrage, you must connect yourself with us. You must identify yourself with our doctrines and leave the great folks to themselves. I replied with all possible civility, that I was certainly indebted to him for his kind advice, though it was not just then in my power to follow it. I assured him that he had formed an unfair opinion of my friend, that our persons and our very lives were common to each other, that our friendship and intimacy were indissoluble, and we had vowed to live and die together, and that nothing could induce us to break that vow. It was altogether a truly comic scene. Sometime after I was dining at the table of a prince, I was seated at the side of my exalted host and was dressed in uniform covered with lace. The member of the institute was one of the guests. Surprise and embarrassment were portrayed in his countenance. I spoke to him several times, but he always drew close to his neighbors, whispering to them and apparently making inquiries. After dinner, he came up to me and very good-humoredly begged me to relieve him from his perplexity. He said he perfectly recollected having had the honor of meeting me before but that he was quite at a loss to comprehend the trick that I had played upon him. I disclaimed any intention of hoaxing him. All that you have seen, said I, and all that I have told you are nothing but reality and truth. The mystery is easily solved. You then saw Monsieur Lesage, who supplies the talent, and you now see Monsieur Le Comte, who provides the funds. You now understand how histories are written, and I have learned how reports are made out. An equally ridiculous mistake procured for Monsieur Lesage in the famous Yellow Dwarf, the honor being set down as a weathercock in quality of genealogist of the order under the humorous name of Parvulus Sapiens, the little sage. For this favor, as I afterwards learned, I was indebted to the suppression that was made during the king's reign of the genealogy of your majesty, whose descent I was supposed to have traced from Aeneas to Ascanius. It is difficult to conceive what could have been meant by all this, as there was nothing in the atlas that could either directly or indirectly have suggested such an idea. However, at all the various times at which the atlas and its author were assailed, numerous zealous and fervent partisans inquired whether I would be pleased to permit them to take up my defense. I invariably desired that the subject might be dropped. I conceived that by thus occupying public attention, I should surely endanger my own tranquility. I smiled at the ill-natured attacks that were made on poor Monsieur Lesage, but I should have been very sorry to have seen them extend to his alias. If, however, my atlas enjoyed this general and extensive success it certainly deserved it the work is indeed adapted to every age to every country 
to every period. It is suited to all opinions, classes, and plans of education. It is an assistant to him who wishes to learn and a remembrancer to him who has learned. It is a guide to the scholar and an illustrator to the master. It embraces chronology, history, geography, politics. To those who understand it and know how to use it, it may truly be said to compose a whole library in itself. It is the Vad Mecham of the pupil and the tutor of the scholar and the man of business. Thus, it had an immediate sale and never I imagined that any literary work proved so productive to its author. On its first appearance, the daily subscriptions frequently amounted to two or three hundred louis. During the period when I personally superintended the publication, I calculated that the receipts constituted a yearly income of at least 60 or 80,000 francs. It procured me a fortune. I had no other, for the revolution had deprived me of my patrimony, which I had afterwards no hope of recovering, for I had been obliged to renounce it upon oath before I could be permitted to set foot on the French territory. There have been published eight or 10,000 copies of my atlas in various editions, and their sale has thrown into circulation eight or 900,000, perhaps a million of francs, out of which there has been a clear profit of 300,000 francs now in my hands. This constitutes my whole fortune, for I possess nothing that has not arisen out of my atlas, and that may not be included in its accounts. On my departure from Europe, there were 150,000 francs due to me, my outstanding debts, either good or bad. I possessed a collection of books obtained by exchange worth 200,000 francs, which being distributed in lots of 1,000 crowns each and exported to foreign countries seemed to promise certain returns. But unfortunately, of all this brilliant produce, I can now only count on what I have ready in my hands. The rest is involved in so many chances that I cannot but consider it as lost. I have no agent in Europe to manage my affairs, for I had not time to make any arrangements for that purpose. And the details are so numerous, scattered, and diversified that I could not possibly give anyone a thread to follow. The outstanding debts are growing old. Some of my debtors are deceased, and some have left the country. And as for the books, they are in a great part scattered about, spoiled, and lost. At one time, my work was on the point of ensuring to me the possession of a brilliant fortune, but my prospects were defeated by the vilest shuffling. These details of the case are so curious that I cannot forbear mentioning them to your majesty. At the commencement of the year 1813, two merchants who had discovered that I was author of Lesage's historical atlas called on me and offered if I would supply them with two million of copies to pay me immediately at the rate of 20% in ready money and to convey the books gratis to London where they should be still my property and should remain at my disposal. I stared at this. I could not conceive what was meant and suspected that the merchants were hoaxing me. They, on the other hand, sought to explain themselves by saying that the offer was made for the sake of procuring licenses and a fair with which they found I was totally unacquainted. Afterwards, on repeating this conversation to a friend, I learned that the vessels which were licensed to sail to England to bring home colonial goods could not leave France without an exportation equal in nominal value to their intended importation. Books were included among the allowable objects of exportation, and the merchants sought to obtain a late freight at a high price, which, at little expense, would entitle them to a considerable importation. My atlas was admirably calculated for this kind of speculation. However, before I entered into any agreement, I consulted the Director General of Customs and the President of the Committee of Exportation, by whom I was informed that the thing was perfectly legal. With this assurance, I immediately set to work. I entered upon one of the most curious speculations that can possibly be conceived. Only a brief interval was allowed me for making the necessary preparations. 30 forms in folio were distributed to 30 other principal printing offices in Paris. And from that moment, the presses were kept at work without intermission. All the wove paper of a certain size was bought up. And it daily increased in price until it reached upwards of 100%. Such general bustle prevailed among all the printers in Paris as to alarm the police until the affair was fully investigated and explained. I afforded employment either directly or indirectly between three and 400,000 hundred hands. At the expiration of one and twenty days, I was to be ready with the two million copies of the Atlas, and I was to receive 400,000 francs of ready money. I was perhaps the only individual in the world who could have engaged in such a speculation. For by a singular chance, I had kept all my forms ready, composed by purchasing the types at a vast expense. 
I was now reaping the fruits of 10 years industry and expenditure. This was truly a prize in the lottery. I was mad with joy at my unexpected good fortune. But alas, I was building on a sandy foundation. I was doomed to pay dearly for a few happy moments of my illusion. The cynical Mr. Dupuy, the director general of the bookselling trade, who was my colleague in the Council of State, seemed bent on my ruin. Though I was enabled to divide the cause of his animosity while he was giving me every assurance of his readiness to serve me, he was in an underhand way exerting every endeavor to injure me and was exciting against me all the most active booksellers whom he had induced to become the agents of his operations. Of these facts, I can entertain no doubt. The letters secretly written on this subject by P were confidently communicated to me, but motives of delicacy forbid my taking the satisfaction of reproaching him with his baseness.